it's 10.50. But we have 10 minutes to ask any questions of all the panels. So, um, yeah, just uh, let us know you're asking the question of, and we'll start with you. Sure. For Peter Ross, um, can you speak to any more detail about deliverables, products, timelines that may come out of these studies with the wastewater treatment plants in your area? Sure. Uh, as you probably know, there have been a few wastewater uh, studies produced. Uh, they all suffer from some of the same weaknesses or lack of concrete ability to compare across studies because of the way in which there's sampled the size, the digestion, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so we're trying to take the best and improve it or to you know, have it sort of open, transparent, and, and comparable. Um, our, we carried out our pilot study for Anastas Island in the year 2016. Uh, we've got a manuscript, uh, should be going to uh, peer review, i.e. submitted to the journal within four weeks, three weeks maybe. Um, and in this day and age, that typically means you know another three, four months for the peer review. Um, so hopefully that'll be published early 2018. That's number one. Uh, we, we're working on a number of other uh, studies that are a little bit more you know, in that, uh, that pipeline, but certainly wastewater study. Um, the pilot will be, that's the manuscript, where uh, the pilot was based on um, uh, four sample days. So it's fairly labor intensive to count. You've been gleaning that. Uh, we are starting uh, a full year to, uh, at the same plant, Anasas Island, to look at seasonality uh, and to look at weekly cycles because laundry tends to be carried out on Saturdays. We're interested in knowing whether there are weekly cycles with regard to uh, microplastics and the influent and effluent. Uh, we're also going to be carrying out a study at Iona, which is a primary plant. So we're sort of looking at all of that. And then the, the partnership with the, uh, the fiber, the, the outdoor apparel uh, companies, uh, that's looking at the washing machine, the effluent, the FTIR signaling. We're doing a weathering study using FTIR, i.e. does the fiber change its infrared spectrum from manufacture to laundry to the ocean. So uh, understanding what happens to signature there. So a few things in the pipeline, but wastewater hopefully, um, as I say, the first one out in uh, hopefully January, February. Is there a mic? It's all right. Um, and so I just had a question as a person who would like to do something on a level at home. So I had a question, I read something about, um, I think it's Whirlpool is in conversation about creating a filter that goes on the washing machine sure. and then it's also the washing bag that you can put your microfiber coating in. Do you know how really long the road the washing machine filter is or that the washing bag works? I bought one, so I want to know. <laughs> <laughs> and I want to make sure that like, what I'm selecting, like at what level am I actually making some sort of improvement? This, it's a team effort. I don't want, I don't want to uh, dominate, but uh, I'll hand over the mic. Um, we're testing uh, three of the filters in our washing machine facility. So we're looking at a Canadian product called the Lint Lover, L-U-V-R, <laughs> out of Eastern Canada. And it was produced by a fellow who was on septic, and uh, he, his basement backed up, and it was a terrible mess. He went, what the heck's going on? And uh, with the plumber and everything, found a big wad of fibers clogging his, his effluent pipe to his septic. So he said, I want to prevent that. So he developed this lint lover trap. Uh, we're testing that. There's a US product as well. Uh, I can't remember the name. There's something called the Cora Bowl. There's crowdfunding, got a lot of attention fairly recently. Uh, there's the guppy bag, which is a bag you can put your products in. Um, so what we need to do is to look at all of these things are going to retain some but not all fibers. So we're, we're going to try to quantify uh, sort of the scores for each one of those products. But your point is a good one. I mean, uh, and we, we have, we've all been basically saying it, that, you know, the teamwork starts at home or with you. Uh, and I think retaining some of the, uh, the fibers that are coming out of our uh, washing machine is really important. Uh, the really interesting side story to this is uh, we all have dryers, or most of us have dryers, and we're cleaning the, the lint trap basically every week with that. So we're, we're not doing that with the washing machine. So you can imagine the, the consequences. The interesting story is that Maytag used to have a, a fiber filter on their products until the early 1980s. They got rid of them because of complaints by consumers that said, my washing machine smells like mildew every time I use it because they weren't maintaining properly. 
weren't following the instructions. Uh, so, yeah, good on you, and uh, stay tuned. There are more products in the pipeline. I think. Got a question back. Yeah, I guess this is for anybody on the panel. I understand where the secondary microplastics come from. Any speculation on where the primary plastics are coming from, the nurdles? Sure. Um, basically, anytime you... Uh, do you guys make coffee? Who made coffee this morning? How many scooped a little bit of coffee in your filter and dropped a couple on your counter? <coughs> yeah, right? Every time, right? And so it's, it's every time you transfer. Anytime it goes from manufacturer, then you have to put it into a bucket, and then a couple will fall out. And then the idea here is that you transfer it from, you know, um, a big bin and you put it onto a train car. And I actually see this a lot, sadly. <laughs> when I go to the Center for Urban Waters, I'll drive right by a plastics manufacturing company. And there's a big train car that's got all the, the pellets in it and on the ground, right? Before it rains, it's all there. And I'm, as soon as it rains, it gets carried off. Think about walking around. It could be coming off of um, basically any kind of a transference of that material. So, and there's industry has definitely cleaned it up, or at least they've put in efforts to do so. Any other comments from you guys? So that's where we call those the nurdles. Sometimes we call them mermaid tears. Yeah, you see them on the beach. So we've been washing um, fleece and other materials for more than a decade, and so how did? <laughs> Well, and, and so I'm curious if anybody is aware of the tipping point. Like, what has led to the realization that this is happening and that this is a problem? Because it seemed to emerge just a couple of years ago. Yeah, I, I think it's more a question, as, as Julie uh, said, it's that we're aware of it. You know, and what happened, we start with the most obvious, the big picture, when you, you see a necropsy gray whale and you see, wow, there's 20 plastic bags in its stomach and a fisherman's boot and something else. And then, wow, look at these albatrosses, you know, in the, in the, whole, the Hawaiian Islands that are dying from plastic ingestion. And, and then it's just a case of, oh, I wonder what's happening at the next level and the next level. And so if you look at the kind of the, the scientific recognition, and I think public awareness tracks the science, it started with macroplastics, the large plastics that were causing obvious impacts that caused people to say, well, if that's happening at that scale, what's happening at finer scales? And that leads us to microplastics, which were not in even the scientific discourse 15 years ago. Um, let alone nanoplastics. And there was the first workshop was 2008, I think. Is that right? The, yeah. With microplastics. And now microplastics, everybody's talking about microplastics. We have a room full of people concerned about microplastics. And now people are talking about nanoplastics. So I think that's how, how the scientific as well as the public awareness has, has followed. Does that address your question? Got one over here. Sorry, this is just a quick follow-up. I don't mean to hammer microplastics and laundry and stuff, but I'm curious about uh, natural fibers and just how long they last, and do they? is it hard to do a false positive on? Most definitely. You know, I was at a, uh, the Ocean Sciences meeting in Hawaii, and a lot of the fibers, they actually took it down and did the, the actual identification of those, and they said the majority in this small study that I saw this talk were cotton fibers. You know that we're identifying in the industry, you know, as researchers, as, as fiber. So it's difficult, and you have to take it a step beyond. And so, and that's a lot more work, you know, to actually do that. But but definitely is something that there has been false identification quite a bit. Yeah. Any other? We haven't been this side of the room. <laughs> yeah. Question over here from yeah. uh, Hillary from Puget Soundkeeper. Um, this is for Julie or Andrew who were talking about um, having to take multiple samples of the same geographical location due to this variability. And I'm wondering, first of all, what accounts for that variability, if you have figured that out, and then if how that contributes to um, you know, maybe making the research take longer and kind of what that looks like. Sure. Just to clarify, with my samples, those were different times of day. So that was my variability. But let's solve it. Do you want to talk about second? Sure. Yeah, I think, so a lot of what we've worked on are sediment samples, um, and yeah, it'll definitely increase the amount of laboratory processing time, but we can take a sediment sample inches apart and see a, num a large difference and a large variability in the number of fibers you're going to get from 
one to the other, so you're not in, you know, working in a homogenized, well-mixed system. Um, and so I think it's really important that we start doing that to better characterize uh, the classics that we're seeing. Um, but yeah, I, I do agree that it's going to take a lot more time. There's no way around that, really. Just, uh, just a quick comment on that. Um, bear in mind that we look at sediments as a sink. Uh, as a possible source, but as a sink. And when we view it that way, the kinds of pollutants that we find in there can tell us uh, wonderful stories about the, our history of contamination, lead, dioxin, PCBs, DDT. You can look at the sediment cores that, um, that we, were, we were hearing about earlier. Um, but for plastics, uh, one of the concerns I think we, we face is that in terms of monitoring and in terms of understanding, is a lot of plastics are either buoyant or neutrally buoyant, which means they're not going to get down into the sediments. So sediments remain in some ways a gold standard of uh, pollution monitoring in aquatic environments. Uh, but for plastics, if we look at the surface of fresh water or the ocean, we look at sort of mid-water, the, the pelagic environment, the neutrally buoyant world for plastics, and we look at sediments, what we're actually going to encounter is a partitioning based on the size and the density uh, of each particle. So it's really important for us to recognize that no matter where we're looking, the consequences um, of understanding of, of what we find is a reflection of, of that matrix or that uh, study design. So um, I think a lot more to learn there. But a lot of the fibers that we see, we're not seeing a lot of fibers in sediments, for example. You do. Okay. Yeah, so lot, lots more there, but um, yeah. And then, of course, fresh water, salt water, brackish, uh, et cetera. So we're kind of getting into you guys' break, so I'm sure you guys are kind of done. Um, so I guess one more. One, more. one more question, and we'll take up a little of your break time. Sure. Um, Patrick had mentioned that there were, uh, he was taking samples from um, commercial fishes, and I was just wondering um, if the effects of microplastics um, when going through di the digestive system, if there's any data or research available um, that is being um, studied about how microplastics affect the human being um, and the human biological, physiological systems. Yeah, that's, uh, that's kind of the $64,000 question or whatever rate of inflation you want to raise it to is ultimately what does it, what does it uh, say about us and what are the implications for human health? Um, and that's certainly a way that a lot of people ultimately want to frame it because that's a way to engage people that may not be otherwise concerned about plastic ingestion by pick your species um, in the marine system. With humans, it hasn't been looked at. Um, it, it gets complicated because we can we wind up with contaminants in our systems from a variety of sources, not just from plastics. And so to tease apart and say that that contaminant is due to plastic ingestion is, is, very, is a very difficult study to undertake meaningfully. And I think that's where working on model species in controlled experimental systems where you're eliminating these other possible sources of contamination are, are really important. And one of the ways to move forward our understanding of the physiological consequences of ingesting and retaining plastic in, in an organism's digestive system. So, so we're, in terms of being able to link to human health directly, I, I would say we're a long way from being able to do that in a, in a meaningful way because of all the other avenues that contaminants can enter our, our bodies. Peter, or Julie, or Andrew, do you? Thank you so much. So we're going to be here all day.